You're listening to mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. We provide easy access to the growing online world of continuing medical education and produce our own consultant-reviewed MRCP-level podcasts. mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. Learn on the move. Hello, my name is Mohamed Sharif. I'm a specialist registrar in hepatology and this podcast will deal with alcoholic liver disease and varices. The podcast will be divided up into sections, the first dealing with epidemiology, the second with decompensated disease and its presentation to the acute medical take, the third with alcoholic hepatitis, and finally we'll touch on varices and their management. Alcohol in excess is the most common cause of liver injury in the developed world. In 1999, it was the most common reason for transplant throughout Europe. From the Chief Medical Officer report of 2002, the deaths from cirrhosis is actually rising, and this is attributed to an increased intake of alcohol in both young women and adolescents. So it is truly a burgeoning problem that Britain has to face. Not all that drink alcohol develop liver disease, and there are four categories of histology that define the severity of the disease. In patients that take excess alcohol, up to 30% will have a normal liver histology. Most, 60 to 100%, will have steatosis, that is fat droplets within the liver, and this is a reversible condition. 20 to 50% will progress to the more severe steatohepatitis, or alcoholic hepatitis, and only less than 10% will develop fibrosis or cirrhosis. Dealing with the metabolism of alcohol, it is important to understand how it is broken down in the liver as this may directly relate to its toxicity upon the organ. It is broken down mainly in the hepatocyte although some extrahepatic breakdown of alcohol does occur particularly in the mucosa and in the gastric area. Ethanol enters the liver and then the cytosol of the hepatocyte is broken down to acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenase. It is thought that acetaldehyde is the injurious metabolic part of alcohol and causes most of the stell damage and necrosis within the hepatocyte. Acetaldehyde in turn is broken down to acetate by aldehyde dehydrogenase and acetate via extrahepatic oxidation is broken down to carbon dioxide and water. Please refer to the figure in the podcast handout. The dose and duration of alcohol is thought to have a direct effect upon the toxicity of the liver. The current recommended daily allowance of alcohol in Britain is 30 grams per day, or 3 units, and for women 20 grams per day, or 2 units. This equates to men having 21 units of alcohol per week and women 14 units of alcohol per week. It is thought that toxicity occurs at higher chronic ingestion of alcohol, up to 160 grams per day for men, 16 units, and 80 grams a day for women, that's 8 units. That equates to 1 unit being equal to 10 grams of alcohol. Binge drinking is not thought to cause progressive cirrhosis, unless it is in excessive amounts, so it is more the chronic ingestion of alcohol at high levels that is thought to cause progressive disease. Genetics may also play a role. Women that drink heavily tend to develop cirrhosis and fibrosis at a much earlier stage and severity than men. This may be due to hormonal factors, but may also be due to reduced expression of alcohol dehydrogenase within the stomach mucosa of women, causing the breakdown of alcohol to be less efficient in women. Aldehyde dehydrogenase may also play a role. In some Asian populations, particularly the Chinese, a mutant form of the gene is expressed. This causes a typical flushing reaction after alcohol is ingested, but in those that become tolerant to this reaction, the breakdown of alcohol is much slower and probably has a more injurious effect upon the liver, therefore speeding cirrhosis. Both high body mass index and diabetes can also accelerate the rate of liver disease progression. This is coined the two-hit hypothesis and probably occurs as there are two factors causing liver damage, either diabetes and high BMI plus alcohol. Immune factors may also play a role. Substances such as TNF and interleukin-10 are thought to cause injury to the liver through alcohol-mediated damage. Indeed, it is interesting that even when some patients stop drinking, they may develop progressive alcoholic liver disease, even in a period of abstinence, therefore implicating immune factors as a possible etiology. In terms of the prevalence of alcohol excess, around 28% of men in the UK drink more than 21 units per week. 
and 5-10% to of men are alcohol dependent. 14% of women drink more than 14 units a week and 3-5% to of women are also alcohol dependent. These statistics are ever-changing and the rate of alcohol consumption to excess in women is increasing. If one looks at the five-year survival of those who have developed cirrhosis, i.e. established liver fibrosis, then the fact of whether they're abstinent or drinking is extremely important in predicting the mortality. As can be seen in the handout of the podcast, 34% survival rates at five years is typical of someone with cirrhotic who has developed complications. Even if no complications have developed, the survival rate is still reduced by around 20-30%. to Of those that die with alcohol-related cirrhosis, 90% of the deaths are liver-related. 33% of these are due to hepatocellular carcinoma. So screening for hepatocellular carcinoma by the use of alpha-fetoprotein and ultrasounds is one of the cornerstones of management of those with cirrhosis in the outpatient clinic. Next we'll deal with the acute decompensation of alcoholic liver disease and its presentation to the General Medical Hospital. Acute decompensation usually occurs in those with cirrhosis and portal hypertension, but can occur in the non-cirrhotic patients in a severe alcoholic hepatitis. It is classified by the presence of jaundice, encephalopathy, ascites or a variceal bleed. The precipitants of decompensation can be multivariant and each has to be assiduously excluded and treated gastrointestinal bleeding, such as a variceal or gastric variceal bleed, infection, chest infections, urinary infections, or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Drugs such as opiates may cause an episode of encephalopathy in those who are cirrhotic, an excess of alcohol or a step up in the amount of alcohol taken, or the development of a tumour such as hepatocellular carcinoma may also induce decompensation. The initial assessment of the patient, of course, deals with airway breathing and circulation and resuscitation to a safe state. Signs of decompensation, such as an asterisk or flap, must be carefully looked for, and the precipitant in terms of infection, bleeding, etc. must be examined for, and this in particular must include a rectal examination to examine for melina. Investigations may include a blood glucose, as blood glucose levels can rise or fall in hepatic disease, the liver being one of the main stores of glycogen in the body, blood tests including an INR group and save in amylase, a chest x-ray, cultures, both sputum, blood, urine and acidic if possible, and of course an acidic tap must be performed for these cultures and the cell count can be gauged. The severity of the liver disease in those who are cirrhotic can be measured by using the child Pew score, This scoring mechanism was originally devised for those undergoing surgical treatment for varices. Although surgical treatment for varices does now not occur, it is still a useful score of predictor of mortality and morbidity in those with cirrhotic liver disease. If you refer to the handout of the podcast, one can see that the bilirubin, prothrombin time, albumin, ascites and the presence or absence of encephalopathy form the basis of the child pew score. A score of 5 to 6 is termed child grade A and usually indicates compensated liver disease or compensated cirrhosis. 7 to 9 intermediate and greater than 10 child grade C which is decompensated cirrhosis which heralds an extremely grim prognosis. The management of a patient presenting with acute decompensation of liver disease will always require some form of resuscitation. One should avoid normal saline as this will tend to accumulate in the abdomen of patients with a low serum albumin. Intravenous vitamins, especially thiamine, should be given before dextrose in those who are drinking heavily as they often tend to be vitamin deficient. One should look carefully and exclude cerebral edema and be careful in giving too much 5% dextrose as this may precipitate this. If the patient is acutely withdrawing from alcohol, then chlordyse epoxide should be prescribed but care should be taken to exclude any form of encephalopathy as chlordyse epoxide is a sedative and will exacerbate this. In those with liver disease, the clotting factors are not normally produced at a sufficient rate from the liver. This causes a coagulopathy. This should be corrected if possible. Often those who are drinking heavily will also be deficient in vitamin K, which is a fat-soluble vitamin taken in the diet. This should be also supplemented either intravenously or orally at the outset. Any infection that is found 
should be actively treated as sepsis is thought to play a main part in decompensation of cirrhosis.